from around the globe. It's theCUBE, with digital coverage of Dell Technologies World. Digital experience, brought to you by Dell Technologies. Hey, welcome back everybody. Jeff Frick here with theCUBE, coming to you from our Palo Alto studios with continuing coverage of the Dell Technology World 2020, the digital experience. We've been covering this for over 10 years. It's virtual this year, but you still have a lot of great content, a lot of great announcements, and a lot of technology that's being released and talked about. So we're excited, we're going to dig a little deep uh, with our next two guests. First off, we have Paul Perez. He is the SVP and CTO of Infrastructure Solutions Group for Dell Technologies. Paul, it's great to see you. Where are you coming in from today? Yeah, I'm in Austin, Texas. Austin, Texas, awesome. And joining him, uh, returning to theCUBE, been on many times, Kit Colbert. He is the Vice President and CTO of VMware Cloud for VMware. Kit, great to see you as well. Where are you joining us from? Uh, thanks for having me again. I'm here in San Francisco. Awesome. So let's jump into it and talk about Project Monterey. You know, it's funny, I was at Intel back in the day and, and all of our passwords used to go out and they became like the, the product names. It's funny how these little internal project names get a life of their own and this is a big one. And you know, we had Pat Gelsinger on a few weeks back at VMware talking about how significant this is and kind of this evolution within the VMware uh, cloud development and you know, it's kind of past Kubernetes and past Tanzu and past Project Pacific and now we're into Project Monterey. So first off, let's start with you, Kit. Give us kind of the basic overview of what is Project Monterey? Yep. Yeah, well, you're absolutely right. What we did last year, we announced Project Pacific, which was really a fundamental rethinking of VMware Cloud Foundation with Kubernetes built in, right? Kubernetes to the core, the core part of the architecture. And the idea there was really to better support modern applications uh, to enable developers and IT operations to come together to work collaboratively toward modernizing a company's application fleet. And if you look at companies starting to be successful there, starting to run these modern applications, what you found is that the hardware architecture itself needed to evolve, needed to update, to support all the new requirements brought on by these modern apps. And so when you're looking at Project Monterey, it's exactly that. It's a rethinking of the VMware Cloud Foundation underlying hardware architecture. And so you think about it, Project Monitor, or excuse me, Project Pacific is really kind of the, the top half, if you will, Kubernetes, consumption experiences, great for applications. Project Monterey comes along as the second step in that journey, really being the bottom half, fundamentally rethinking the hardware architecture and leveraging smart neck technology to do that. It's pretty interesting, Paul. You know, it's, there's a, a, a great shift in this whole move from you know, infrastructure driving applications to applications driving infrastructure. And then we're seeing you know, obviously the big move with, with big data. And again, I think as, uh, as Pat talked about in his interview with, with NVIDIA being at the right time, at the right place with the right technology and this you know, kind of groundswell of GPU and now DPU you know, helping to move those, those um, workloads beyond just kind of where the CPU uh, used to do all the work. This is even, you know, kind of taking it another level. You guys are the, the hardware guys and the solutions guys. As you look at this kind of continuing evolution, both of workloads as well as infrastructure, how does this fit in? Well, Jeff, how this fits in is uh, modern applications and modern workloads require modern infrastructure, right? And uh, Kit was talking about the infrastructure overlay that VMware is awesome at developing. Um, I was coming at this from the emergence of data centric workloads and some of the implications for that, including silicon diversity, heterogeneous computing, the need to disaggregate, uh, to be able to combine many resources together as opposed to trying to shoehorn something into a mechanical chassis. And, uh, and if you disaggregate, you have to be able to compose on demand. And when Kit and I started comparing those, we realized that we were hunting on a, on a convergent trajectory and we decided to team up. Yep. So it's interesting because part of the composable um, philosophy, if you will, is to, you know, just to break the components of compute store and networking down to as small pieces as possible, and then you can assemble the right amount when you need it to attack a particular problem. But we're t you're talking about it's a whole different uh, level of, of bringing the right hardware to bear for the solution. When you talk about smart NICs and you talk about GPUs uh, and DPUs, data processing units, you're now starting to offload, and even FPGAs and some of these other things, offload a lot of work from the core 
CPU to some of these more appropriate devices. That said, you know, <laughs> how do people make sure that the right application ends up on the right infrastructure so that I'm, if it's appropriate, using more of a, of a Monterey-based uh, solution versus more of a traditional one, depending on the workload? How is that going to get all kind of sorted out and, and routed within the actual cloud infrastructure itself? That's probably back to you, uh, Kit. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> so I think it's important to understand kind of what a smart NIC is and how it works in order to answer that question. Because what we're really doing is, um, to kind of jump right to it, I guess, is you know giving an API into the infrastructure. And this is how we're able to do all the things that you just mentioned. But what is a smart NIC? Well, a smart NIC is essentially a NIC with a general purpose CPU on it, really a whole CPU complex. In fact, kind of a whole system, whole server uh, right there on that, on that NIC. And so what that enables is uh, a bunch of great things. So first of all, to your point, we can do a lot of offload. We can actually run ESX ESXi on that NIC. We can take a lot of the functionality that we were doing before on the main server CPU, uh, things like network virtualization, storage virtualization, security functionality. We can move that all off onto the NIC. And that makes a lot of sense because really what we're doing when we're doing all those things is really looking at different sort of IO data paths. Uh, you know, uh, as, as the, the network traffic comes through, uh, looking at doing automatic load balancing, firewalling for security, uh, de delivering storage perhaps remotely. And so the NIC is actually a perfect place uh, to place all of these functionalities, right? You can um, not only move it off the core server CPU, but you can get a lot better performance because you're now right there on the data path. So I think that's the first really key point is that you can get that offload. But then once you have all that functionality there, then you can start doing some really amazing things. Uh, this ability to expose uh, additional virtual devices onto the PCI bus. This is another great capability of a smart NIC. So when you plug it in physically in, into the motherboard, it's, it's a NIC, right? You can see that. And when it starts up, it looks like a NIC to the motherboard to the x86 system. But then via software, you can have it expose additional devices. It could look like a storage controller or it could look like an FPGA. It could look at really any sort of device. And you can do that not only for the local uh, machine where it's plugged in, but, it, but potentially remote machines as well with the right sorts of interconnects. And so what this creates is a whole new sort of cluster architecture. And that's why we're really so excited about it because you get all these great benefits in terms of offload, performance improvement, security improvement, but then you get this great ability to get very dynamic disaggregation and composability. So, so Kit, how much of it is the routing of the workload to the right place, right? That's got mm -hmm. the right amount of, say it's a super data intensive, it wants a lot of GPU, versus actually better executing the operation once it gets to the place where it's going to yeah. run. Yeah, it's a bit of a combination actually. So the powerful thing about it is that in a traditional world, where you run an application, you know, the server that you run it, that app can really only use the, the local devices there. Yes, there is some newer stuff like NVMe over fabric where you can remote uh, certain types of storage capabilities, uh, but there's no real general purpose solution to that yet. That generally speaking, that application is limited to the local hardware devices. Well, <clears throat> the great part about what we're doing uh, with Monterey and with the SmartNIC technology is that we can now dynamically uh, remote or expose remote uh, devices from other hosts. And so wherever that application runs matters a little bit less now in the sense that we can give it the right sorts of hardware it needs in order to operate. You know, if you have, let's say, a few machines with uh, FPGAs, normally if an app needed that FPGA, you have to run locally, but now it could actually run remotely and you can better balance out things like compute requirements versus, you know, specialized accelerator requirements. And so I think what, what we're looking at is, especially in the context of VMware Cloud Foundation, is bringing that all together. We can look through the scheduling, uh, figure out what the best host for it to run on based on all these considerations. And then if it, we are missing, let's say a physical device it needs, well, we can remote that and sort of uh, deal with that uh, missing gap there. Right, right, that's great. Paul, I want to go back to you. You, you just talked about you know, kind of coming at this problem from a data centric point of view and you're running infrastructure and you're, you're, <laughs> you're the poor guy that's got to catch all the asymptote or the, the, the giant uh, exponential curves up and to the right on the data flow and the data quantity. How, how is that impacting the way you think about infrastructure and designing infrastructure and changing infrastructure and kind of future proofing infrastructure when you know just around the corner is 5G and IoT and oh, you ain't seen nothing yet in terms of the data flow. 
Yeah, so Jeff, I, I come at this from two angles, right? One that we talked about briefly is the evolution of the workloads themselves. The other angle, which is just as important, is the operating model that customers are wanting to evolve to. And in that context, we talk a lot about how cloud is an operating model, not necessarily a destination, right? So what I, and one way to get out what Kit was talking about is that in data center computing, you have a separation of control and data plane where the data plane runs on optimized silicon, GPUs, FPGAs, offload engines, uh, and uh, the control plane can run on stuff like x86 and ARM. The nice thing about SmartX is SmartX have ARM cores, so you can implement some data plane and some control plane, and they can also be the gateway, because you know you talked about composability. Uh, what has been done up until now is early core screen, right? We're carving out software-defined infrastructure out of predefined hardware blocks. What we're talking about is making, you know, GPUs residents in a fabric, persistent memory resident on a fabric, NVMe over fabric, uh, and being able to tile computing topologies on demand to realize an application's intent, and we call that intent-based computing. Right. Well, just and and to follow up on that too, as as the you know, cloud as an attitude or as an operating model or whatever you want to say, you know, not necessarily a place or uh, a thing uh, has changed. I mean, how has that had to get you to shift your infrastructure approach? Because you've got to support, you know, old school, good old data centers. Uh, we've got, you know, some stuff running on public clouds and then now you've got hybrid clouds uh, and you have multi-clouds, right? So we know, you know, you're out in the field that people have workloads running all over the place. So, but they got to control it and they've got compliance issues and they got a whole bunch of other stuff. So from as your point of view, as you see the desire for more flexibility, the desire for more uh, infrastructure centric uh, support for the, for the workloads that I want to buy and the increasing amount of those that are, that are more data centric uh, as we move to hopefully more data driven decisions. How's it changed your strategy and what does it mean to partner and, and have a real nice formal uh, relationship with the folks over at VMware, or excuse me, VMware? Well, I think that, um regardless of how big a company is, um, it's always prudent, as I say, when I approach my job, right, architecture is about balance and efficiency and it's about reducing contention. And we like to leverage industry R&D, especially in cases where one plus one equals two, right? In the case of, uh, in the case of Project Monterey, for example, one of the, one of the collaboration areas is in, in improving the security model and being able to provide more air gap isolation, especially when you consider that enterprise wants to behave as service providers internal to their companies. And therefore this is important. And because of that, I think that there's a lot of things that we can do between VMware and Dell, blending, blending hardware and for example, assets like NSX in a different way that will give customers higher scalability and performance and more control. You know, beyond, beyond VMware and, and Dell EMC, I think that um, we're partnering with, uh, obviously the SmartNIC vendors, because they're SmartNIC to represent the gateway to those data plane, uh, data plane assets, but also companies that are innovating in data center computing, for example, NVIDIA. Right, right. And, and I think that uh, what we're seeing is, while well, you know, NVIDIA has done an awesome job of targeting their capability at AI ML type of workloads, what we realize is applications today depend on platform services, right? And up until recently, those platform services have been databases, messaging pipes, Active Directory. Moving forward, I think that within five years, most applications will depend on some form of AI ML service. So I, I can see an opportunity to go mainstream with this. Right, right. It's, well, it's great you bring up NVIDIA and, and I'm just going to quote uh, one of Pat's lines from, from his interview. And he talked about Jensen from NVIDIA actually telling Pat, hey Pat, I think you're thinking too small. 
I love it. You know, let's do the entire AI, AI landscape together and make AI and enterprise class workloads uh, from VMware and Tanzu, you know, first class citizens. So I, I love the fact, you know, Pat's been around a long time, uh, industry veteran, but still, you know, kind of accepted the challenge from Jensen to really elevate um, AI and machine learning via GPUs to first class citizen status. And the other piece obviously that's coming up is edge. So, uh, you know, it's a, it's a nice shot of, uh, of adrenaline and uh, Kit, I wonder, you know, if you can share your thoughts on that, you know, in kind of saying, hey, let's, let's take it up a notch, a significant notch by leveraging a whole nother class of compute power within these solutions. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, I'll, I'll go real quick. I mean, <clears throat> it's funny because like not many people really ever challenge Pat to say he doesn't think big enough, <laughs> you know, because usually he's always blown us away with what he wants to do next. Um, but I, I think it's, I think it's, uh, you know, it's good though. It's good to keep us on our toes and push us a bit, right? All of us within the industry. And so I think a couple of things, you know, to go back to your previous point around this like cloud as a model, I think that's exactly what we're doing is trying to bring cloud as a model even on-prem and it's a lot of these kind of core hardware architecture capabilities that we need to enable. The biggest one in my mind is being enabling an API into the hardware so the applications can get what they need. And going back to Paul's point, this notion of these AI and ML services, you know, they have to be rooted in the hardware, right? We know that in order for them to be performant, for them to run to support what, what our customers want to do, we need to have that deeply integrated into the hardware all the way up. But then it also becomes a software problem. Once we got the hardware solved, once we got that architecture locked in, how can we as easy as possible, as seamlessly as possible, deliver all those great capabilities, software capabilities? And so, you know, you look at what we've done with the NVIDIA partnership, things around the NVIDIA GPU cloud and really bringing that to bear. And so then you start having this, this really great full stack integration all the way from the hardware, very powerful uh, hardware architecture that, you know, again, driven by API, the infrastructure software on top of that, and then all these great uh, AI tools, uh, tool chains capabilities with things like the NVIDIA NGC. So that's really, I think, where the vision's going. And uh, we got a lot of the, the basic parts there, but obviously a lot more work to do going forward. Right. Yeah, I, I would say that, you know, initially, uh, look, Jack, we're on a journey. Right? We want this journey, however, to happen very fast. And initially, uh, what we'll focus is in disaggregating, and I think in two things, disaggregating infrastructure services so there's no contention with applications, customer actual workload applications, you know, and also in enabling how productive it is to get to that optimized silicon for the data path over time, um, just like we have the Tanzu mission control um, over a wide area, there's, a, there's an opportunity to do something like that locally to make sure that you think about the progression from bare metal to VMs to containerized environments. Containerized environments are way more dynamic and more shreddable, right? And they expect hardware to be as dynamic and composable to suit their needs real time. And uh, I think that's, that's where we're headed. Right. So let me so let me throw a monkey wrench in in terms of security, right? So now this thing is much more flexible. It's much more software defined. Um, how is that changing the way you think about security and bake security in throughout the stack? Go to you first, Paul. Yeah. Yeah. So like <clears throat> um, this actually enables a lot of really powerful things. So first of all, from an architecture and implementation standpoint, you have to understand that we're really running two copies of ESXi on each physical server now. We've got the one running on the x86 side, just like normal. And now we've got one running on the SmartNIC as well. And so, as I mentioned before, we can move a lot of that uh, networking, security, et cetera, capabilities off to the SmartNIC. <clears throat> and so what this is going toward is what we call a zero trust security architecture. This notion of having really defense in depth at many different layers and many different areas. Uh, while obviously the hypervisor and the virtualization layer provides a really strong level of security, um, you know, when we, we, even when we were doing it completely on the x86 side, now that we're running on a smart NIC, that's additional defense in depth because the x86 ESX doesn't really know and doesn't have direct access to the ESXi running on the smart NIC. So the ESXi and the smart NIC can be this kind of more well defended position. Moreover, now that we're running those security functionalities directly 
on the data path in the SmartNIC, we can do a lot more with that. We can run a lot deeper analysis, you know, talk about AI and ML, bring a lot of those capabilities to bear here uh, to actually improve the, the security profile. And so finally, I'd say this notion of kind of distributed security as well, that you don't necessarily want to have these individual points on the physical network, but actually distribute the security policies and enforcement to everywhere where a server is running, i.e. everywhere where a smart NIC is. And that's what we can do here. And so it really takes a lot of what we've been doing with things like NSX, but now connects it much more deeply into hardware, allowing for better performance and security. Paul? Yeah, you know, on our side, um, a common attack method is to intercept the boot of the server, physical server. And, you know, I'm, I'm actually very proud of our team because our, the U.S. National Security Agency recently published a white paper on best practices for secure boot. And they picked our implementation of hardware root of trust and secure boot as the reference standard, right? Moving forward, uh, imagine an environment that even if you gain control of the server, that doesn't allow you to change files or update it. So we're moving the root of trust to be in that air gap domain that Kit talked about. And that gives us uh, way more capability for zero trust operations. Right, right. Uh, Paul, I, I got to ask you, I had uh, Sam Bird on the other day, uh, your, your, uh, your peer who runs the, the PC group. Um, well, he's not a peer. He's a little bit higher up. A little bit higher than you. Okay. Well, I just promoted you, so that's okay. But um, but it's really interesting because we were talking about it was literally like ten years ago the death of the PC article that came out when when Apple introduced the the tablet and you know we talked about what phenomenal uh, devices that PCs continue to be and evolve and then it's just funny how now that dovetails with this whole edge conversation when people don't necessarily think of a PC as a piece of the edge but it is a, a great piece of the edge. So from an infrastructure point of view, you know to have that kind of presence within the PCs and, and, and kind of potentially that intelligence. And again, this kind of whole nother layer of interaction with the users and an opportunity to define how they work with applications and prioritize applications. I just wonder if you can share how nice it is to have that, you know, kind of in your back pocket to know that you've got a whole nother, you know, kind of layer of visibility and, and connection with the users beyond just simply the infrastructure. So actually within the company, we develop within a framework that we call core edge multi-cloud, right? Core data centers, enterprise edge, IOT, and then off-premise. Because it, it is, it is a, a multi-cloud world. And, uh, and within that framework, we consider our client solutions group products to be part of the edge. And we see a lot of benefit. I'll give an example of a, a healthcare company that wants to uh, develop real-time analytics, regardless of whether it's on a laptop or maybe move it to a back-end data center, right? Whether it's at a hospital clinic or at a patient's home. Uh, it gives us a broader innovation surface and a lot of synergy. And actually, the, uh, a lot of people may not appreciate that the most important function within Sense Team, I consider it to be the uh, experience design team. So being able to design user flows and customer experience ahead of the technology is, is uh, very powerful. That's great, that's great. So we're, we're running out of time. I want to give you each the last word. You've both been in this business for a long time. Uh, this is brand new stuff, right? Container, containers aren't new. Kubernetes is still relatively new and exciting and Project Pacific was relatively new and now Project Monterey. But you guys are, you know, you're multi-decade veterans in this thing. As you as you look forward, what does this moment represent um, compared to some of the other shifts that we've seen in IT, you know, generally, but you know, kind of consumption of compute and you know, kind of this application-centric world that just continues to grow. I mean, uh, software is eating everything. We know it. You guys live it every day. What is? Where are we at now? And you know, what do you see? Maybe I don't want to go too far out, but the next couple of years within the Monterey framework, and then if you have something else generally, uh, you can add as well. Uh, Paul, why don't we start with you? Well, I, I think, uh, look, on a personal level and humility aside, uh, I have a long string of very successful endeavors in my career. When I came back to Dell a couple of years ago, 
one of the things that I told Jeff Clark, our vice chairman, is, hey, Dell Technologies is a big canvas, and I intend to paint my masterpiece. And I think that, you know, Monterey is part of that, and what we're doing in support of Monterey is also part of that. Uh, I think that you will see, you will see our initial approach focus on, on core data centers. Um, I can tell you that we know how to express it at the edge, and we know also how to express some of it even in a multi-cloud world. So I'm very excited, and I know that I'm going to be busy for the next few years. <laughs> uh, Kit, to you. Yeah, so you know, it's funny. You talk to people about SmartNIC, and especially those folks that have been around for a while, and what you hear is like, hey, you know, people were talking about smart NICs 10 years ago, 20 years ago, that sort of thing. Then they kind of died off. So what's different now? And I think you know, the big difference now is a few things. You know, first of all, it's the core technology of smart NIC has dramatically improved. Uh, we now have a you know, powerful software infrastructure layer that can take advantage of it. And you know, finally, you know, applications have a really strong need for it. Again, with all the things we talked about, the need for offload. So I think there's some real sort of fundamental shifts that have happened over the past, let's say decade, uh, that have driven the need for this. And so this is something that I believe strongly is here to last. You know, both ourselves at VMware as well as Dell are making a huge bet on this, but not only that, and, and not only is it good for customers, it's actually good for all the operators as well. So whether this is part of VCF that we deliver to customers for them to operate themselves, just like they always have, or if it's part of our own cloud solutions, things like VMware Cloud on Dell, this is going to be a core part about how we deliver our cloud services and, and infrastructure going forward. So we really do believe this is kind of a foundational transition that's taking place. And as we talked about, there is a ton of additional innovation that's going to come out of it. So I'm really, really excited for the next few years because I think we're just at the start of a very long and very exciting journey. Awesome. Well, thank you both for, for spending some time with us and sharing the story and congratulations. I'm sure a whole bunch of work for, from a whole bunch of people went into getting, uh, to getting where you are now. And, and as you said, Paul, the work has uh, barely just begun. So thanks again. Thank you. All right. He's Paul, he's Kit, I'm Jeff. You're watching The Cubes, continuing coverage of Dell Tech World 2020, the digital experience. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. <laughs>